Today we actually have a pretty fun class. We are going to be talking about Gestalt theory. Actually, before I get started, let me mention one thing. I forgot my watch. So I'm periodically going to be picking up my iPod to see what time it is. If I get to, what is it, 11, 10, what time is this last end? Is it 9.30 to? 9.30 to 9.45? I think you're pulling my leg. There's a time warp, right? 10.45. So if by 10.40 I'm still talking a lot and it looks like I'm not going to stop, let me know because I'm happy to keep you here forever. Okay, so Gestalt theory. Has anyone ever heard of Gestalt theory? One person. Two people. One, or one and a half. Oh wait, two and a half people. I did, but I forgot. You did, but you forgot. I know. It's one of those terms you're like, it's a what? Well, this is another one of those things that when I show you what it is, you're going to look at it and say, oh yeah, I've seen that. It's one of those artsy, fartsy things, right? Who thinks it's like all artsy before I even tell you what it is? It sounds artsy, doesn't it? it? Yeah, it actually is used in art quite a bit, and that's where you will have seen it. I think you're going to be a little surprised at how well it actually maps on to good design. Oh, and by the way, this is from the uh, Johnson book. It's from chapters 2, 3, and 6. All right, so let's start talking about what exactly is Gestalt theory. Well, Gestalt theory really focuses on how we perceive things, how the mind perceives things. So it's not really looking at how our eyes perceive things. It's how do we perceive things, and then our mind takes that information and interprets it. Because think about it, and when it comes to interaction design and user experience, it's not literal. We are interpreting these things. Now, one of the ways that you can think about Gestalt theory is a way a thing has been placed or put together. Because there actually is no real direct English translation. So you're really looking at things visually, perceptually, and how we interpret those things. How do we put different components of what's going on around us together and how do we interpret that in our minds? How does it make it easier or more difficult for us to understand what's going on in the world? Now, sometimes you may run across some common translations. Some people call it its form. It's looking at the form of something. Others will say, well, it's looking at shapes and looking at the shapes of things. But if you actually talk to gestalt theorists, one of the things they're going to say is something that I am positive all of you have heard in some form of another. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. How many of you have heard that? Is anyone who hasn't heard of it? Okay, everyone's heard of it. Oh, no, two, two people haven't heard of it. All right, so I want you guys to think about it for a few minutes. And it actually may be easier for those of you who haven't heard of it than those of you who have. And I want you to think about what does that mean? What do you think that means when we're perceiving something? Anyone want to take a guess? Anyone? One person. Um, because you perceive things as a whole, not. Right, so we have a tendency to perceive things as a whole. That's how we interpret things. Right, so. When you are looking at a computer screen, you're not taking, taking an interface apart and saying, OK, I'm going to look, OK, there's the menu, and there it says File, and look, there's a button, and it says this, and oh, wait, there's an image there. You're not breaking it up into little pieces. You are looking at it as a whole. Now, if there is something that requires your locus of attention, then that then, of course, becomes your focus, and you will look at that quote unquote part. Very often, that part is actually still has other various smaller pieces. Let's look at a piece of art really quick. What do you see? Real quick. Some people see birds, some see turtles. So now you see all of them. 
Now, before I asked you what you see, what, and you started looking at all the components, when you first glance at it, do you see all of that? No. What do you see? You see the whole thing. You see colors. You see a, a symmetrical pattern. So that's the idea of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Right? You're looking at the thing as a whole. We have a tendency to do that. Remember when we talked about, uh, let's see, was it the Jesus and the toast? All right, when, you look at the, when, when people look at the Jesus and the toast, are they looking at, okay, so this part is burnt and this part is not burnt. There's a crumb here. Is that what people did? No. No, is that why people got so much money on eBay for it? No, it's because they looked at the whole thing and they're like, oh, it's Jesus. We have a tendency to interpret things more as a whole until we are focusing our attention on something. So there are a number of Gestalt laws that we're actually going to be going through. Now what's interesting about the Gestalt laws is one, they can really help you create a better design. Because it really talks about how we perceive things. What makes it easier for us to see certain aspects of something. But here's one thing you want to remember that's also interesting about Gestalt. Is that these laws can often work in conjunction with each other. Why? Because you want to remember, even though we have these different laws, and we'll go through them very quickly in, the, in a minute, and then we'll look at each in more detail. Even though they're specific traits or specific aspects that makes design better or can make design better, you want to remember that we still look at things as a whole. That includes at a level even above this, where if you have say proximity and similarity in an image, you're not just focusing on proximity and focusing on similarity. You're still looking at it as a whole. So it's not as if there is one whole, there may be multiple holes depending on what you're focusing on. So let's go through each one really quickly. First there's proximity. Objects tend to be grouped together according to their proximity. So the closer things tend to be to each other, the more likely we are to group them together. Similarity. Similar objects tend to be grouped together. If a group of objects is similar, we're more likely to see it as one unit. Continuity. Our visual perception is biased to perceive continuous forms rather than disconnected segments. That one's really fun. And I think you're going to be a little surprised at how we automatically do this. And you've actually done it yourself multiple times. Then there's closure. We automatically try to close open figures so that they are perceived as a whole object rather than as separate pieces. A lot of times continuity and closure do go together. Not all the time, but a lot of times. We're going to look at some really, really fun examples. There are a few more that we're going to look at. There's symmetry. We tend to parse complex scenes in a way that reduces complexity. We want to be able to interpret it quickly, so we try to simplify things. Figure ground. Our mind separates the visual field into the figure, which is the foreground, and the ground, which is the background. Common fate. Objects that move together are perceived as grouped or related. So let me give you a quick example of common fate. You're walking on campus. You see a group of very young looking students that are moving together. What are they? Usually the, yeah, usually the high school students. Now, do you have to think about it? Not usually, you're like, ooh, high school students. I'm going this way. Common fate, they're all moving together. Now they usually also have like these little badges too, so there you have what did, that we just talked about. If they're all wearing the same badge. Similarity. 